Welcome. I am Yamla, and this is the R Spot. This is a very special edition of the R Spot, our very first live podcast. First, because we are celebrating the conclusion of our first season, 52 episodes in the can. And I would like to thank all of you who tune in weekly to hear the R Spot on Shondaland Audio or iHeart or Spotify. I wanna thank you for your support, but most of all, I wanna thank you for your commitment to make your loving and intimate relationships better because that's what we talk about on the R Spot, how to heal, grow, and transform our relationships to make them more loving, more fulfilling, and more productive. The other reason we are doing this special edition is because recently I sparked an international conversation <laughs> by asking Ebony K. Williams what I thought was a very simple question. And that question set off a firestorms of conversations and debate that has had many twists and turns, so many that I think people forgot the reason for the question and the context of my conversation with Ebony. So shout out to my Soror Ebony and to all my AKA sisters. But I, I want to start right here. To all of the bus drivers, the UPS drivers, the FedEx drivers, to the sanitation workers and the EMS technicians and the postal workers, to the truck drivers who bring the milk that my great grandson drinks and the bread that I love to the supermarkets, <laughs> to the plumbers and the electricians, and, and yes, to even some of the Uber drivers. I would date you. <laughs> I want you to be real clear. I would date you and I thank you for being the heartbeat of this country. I really do. And yes, I'm a lawyer. And yes, I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a law degree, and an Emmy. I've been on the New York Times bestsellers list seven times, for several times, for some of the 19 titles that I've authored. And to you, beloved blue collar, hard working men out there, I would date you in a hot Mississippi minute if. <laughs> and here are my conditions, okay? If you're good to your mother and if you are in good relationship with the God of your understanding and if you take care of or have taken care of all of the children you've sired and if you treat me well, if you treat me well, yeah, I would date you because I believe those are good ingredients. And if you have good ingredients, you can make a great meal. <laughs> together, grow together, build together, evolve together, create together with good ingredients. And those things that I mentioned, I believe all of those are good ingredients. So let me be real clear about why I focused or why I presented the bus driver. Because in my mind, a bus driver is an individual who is focused, an individual who has self-discipline and self-control. A bus driver will eat his food out of a paper bag while he drives, and he doesn't stop to pee unless his passengers need to pee, okay? To me, that spells compassion. A bus driver has vision, and he pays attention to detail. He has to know what's going on in the bus, in front of the bus, and behind the bus in order to get his passengers where they're going, to get them there safely. So that tells me I can trust a bus driver with my life. And in my mind, these are all good ingredients. So yeah, I would date you. And that's why we're here today, because I want to continue and expand the conversation of love with conditions. Why we use or should we use status, income, and position as the criteria for dating and mating? How do we do that? Why do we do that? And most important of all, is it working? 
Now hear me, everyone is entitled to their preferences and their standards. And what happened was when I asked Ebony that question, she said, only if he owned the bus. Well, see, if you're gonna have a standard, let him own the bus company. Because if that one bus breaks down, y'all are done. Just like if the lawyer or the doctor or the dentist loses his job, breaks his arm, can't practice anymore. So if we, everybody is entitled to or has their standards and their preference, but are they working? And are the standards now obsolete based on the conditions and the realities that we face in the world? Are the demands that you're holding for someone else to live up to, are they working to get you what you say you want? So that's the question that we're going to nibble on together because people have taken this question and turned it into something else out of the context of our original conversation, which didn't even have anything to do with dating. So for those of you who are just turning in, welcome to the R Spot. I am Iyamla. And this is a very special episode of the R Spot because we're live today on Facebook, YouTube, and I believe IG or Twitter. So if you're at work hovering over in the corner to listen, <laughs> I want to thank you. Let me share how this is going to work today. For the first hour of the R Spot, we're going to, in our time together, I want to continue the conversation that I began when I was a guest on The Grio with Ebony Williams. And believe it or not, we were not talking about dating, but that show went viral. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Then, listen, in the second hour, I'm going to open the phone lines and ask you the same question that I asked Ebony. Would you date a bus driver or a cab driver or grave digger? And why is somebody in a blue collar job considered less than? And people are talking about, I want black women to lower their standards. I wasn't even talking about dating. So can you hear and do you listen? Because that's a very important quality in a relationship, whether you're dating a bus driver or a CEO. I want to know if the way of the world today is about transactional relationships, what you can give and get, what you can do for me, what I can get from you, is that where we are? Is the way of relationships in the world today about loving with conditions? Or are we willing to accept a good person with good ingredients and do the work to create a great meal? So in the second hour, I want to talk to you. If you have a question or a comment or a perspective, you will be able to call me live at 775-307-7768. But don't call now. I want you to call when you can contribute to the context of the conversation. Because what's happening out there in the world right now, I ain't have nothing to do with that. <laughs> I don't even recognize it. So let me start here for those who don't even know about the 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 conversation. Ebony K. Williams asked me to be a guest on her show on The Grio to discuss a statement that I made. Shout out to Ebony and all of my AKA sorors. I made a statement on The Breakfast Club. Shout out to The Breakfast Club. And Charlemagne and DJ Envy, don't be on nationally syndicated radio and television telling people I'm old. <laughs> I heard you. I had my ear on you. The word is elder, not old. <laughs> so there. But the comment that I made on TBC was about women demonstrating and, and manifesting more masculine energy than feminine energy. And Ebony gave her, her experience that she can't trust that a man will show up. And that's why she feels many women have this masculine approach. But in today's world, I'm experiencing more and more women who operate from the intellect, which is masculine, rather than the heart, which is feminine. Now, that does not mean that we can't be bus drivers or own bus companies or be truck drivers or boxers. Doesn't mean that we can't sleep with whomever we choose. What it means that is that as a feminine expression of God's source creator, 
We as women carry and anchor a certain energy, a heart energy on the planet. And that energy is purposeful. The energy of forgiving grace, of compassion, mercy, caring, nurturing, nourishing the earth and people on the earth. And that's a tender energy, a nurturing energy that somehow gets lost in the transactions of taking and getting in relationships. However, however, I also acknowledge because of the way women are educated, programmed, and conditioned in today's world, because of our experiences and our familial and intimate relationships, our feminine energy has been distorted, denied, diminished, and dishonored by us as women and the world at large. That was the conversation, okay, <laughs> that somehow has gotten lost. And as an alpha woman, I recognize that I am an alpha woman. And I understand how and why I shifted more into providing and protecting, driving rather than being driven. I understand why it was difficult for me to nurture from my heart, to teach by tender, gentle demonstration of what it means to be a feminine expression of life. And like so many women, young, old, black, white, I was taught and conditioned to be hard and strong, but not powerful, okay? I denied my innate power as a woman and sought power based on a masculine construct, which is about doing rather than being, okay? Masculine construct, which is about speaking rather than listening. Aggression rather than surrender and receptivity. I was taught to be intelligent, not to be intuitive. My intuition didn't make logical sense, so I denied it. I was taught to be independent rather than interdependent, rigid rather than flexible, competitive rather than cooperative. I was taught that. I was taught to be tough, not tender, because tender is weak. As a woman, as a young girl, I was taught to get and take rather than give and serve. And when I did serve, it was a place it was from a place of better than and less than, rather than in recognition of equality, humanity, and equanimity. Along the way of that toughness, hardness, roughness, meanness, along the way with compounded disappointments and betrayals, where I didn't get what I wanted or, or thought I, I didn't get what I deserved, I lost faith in life and in myself, and in people. And that made me afraid to be vulnerable because vulnerability means being weak. And I cannot be weak because that means that I'll get hurt again, disappointed again, denied or dismissed again. And it was my toughness, my competitiveness, and my emptiness as a woman that showed up in every room I entered. And as a woman, I, I was miserable, unhappy, and mean as hell. <laughs> Thank God I'm better now. <laughs> that was in my 20s and my 30s. Then through many years of self-work and self-awareness, I learned a different construct for living my life as a woman. I reworked and recaptured my rites of passage, my blessings, my lessons, my ceremonies, my gifts. I stopped being angry and I became curious. I stopped knowing everything and became teachable. At 20, I thought I knew the answer to every question, but at 40, I realized I didn't even know what the question was. <laughs> so I studied hard. I took copious notes. And I sought guidance, not just from without, but also from within. Then my consciousness shifted about who I am. And my heart shifted. And I shifted. And you know what happened? My life and relationships became easier. 
more productive, more loving, and most of all, peaceful. So when I invited Ebony to sh share my, when Ebony invited me to share my perspective about women and being a woman, I was honored. And it was in that conversation that I posed the question to her when she was complaining about black men. I posed the question to her and, and, and dare I say, I thought it was a simple question, but it sparked a controversial conversation. So I'm going to continue that conversation today, not just with you, <laughs> but also with a man. All right. <laughs> that man is my brother from another mother. <laughs> that man is a friend a non-sexual friend. And I'm going to tell you why that's important as a woman. Dr. Steve Perry is a social worker. That means that he knows how to help individuals and groups and families prevent and cope with the problems of their everyday life. And good God knows our relationships are problems. Dr. Steve Perry is also an educator, the founder and director of not one, but two charter schools, the Harlem Prep Charter Schools, both in Connecticut and Harlem. He has taken his knowledge and training as a social worker and committed them and his resources to serve his community, specifically the children in his community. And I asked him here today because he has firsthand knowledge and experience of how women are showing up in the world, particularly how mothers are showing up and the impact it's having, not only on men and how we look down on men, but how it's impacting our children. So for those who are just turning in, welcome to this special edition of the R Spot being recorded live. Our subject matter today is love with conditions, using income status, economic positioning as the criteria for dating and mating. <laughs> and what has hit the floor and splattered all over the world uh, on the walls of the world is a, is a complex question. Would you date a bus driver? And I've already seen in the comments people talking about they wouldn't date a bus driver. But I want to share something with you that Roland Martin told me the other day. He said, for many women, the standards that they set for the men their daddies couldn't meet. Could your daddy meet your standards yes. that you are expecting someone else's son to meet? Would you date a bus driver, a sanitation worker, an EMS technician, or a grave digger? or any one of the other 100 blue collar workers that keep our society running. So I invited a guest here today, Dr. Steve Perry, social worker turned educator who deals with women and the complicated ways in which we show up. Welcome Dr. Perry, thank you for sharing your hey, time. Sis, I'm, listen, I'm glad to be here, You here you did it again. Holy cow, the question heard around the world. Would yes. you date a bus driver? What is it that made you ask that question? Well, because I heard the things that Ebony was saying about her experiences with men. And I'm sure we all have a story. But here's the thing, Steve. You know, while women are complaining about the men, some man is on a therapist's couch because of his relationship with her. <laughs> <laughs> and we never think about that. But I asked her that question because, again, as a woman, I was reading her energy. See, I was feeling her energy as a woman. What did you read, though? Really, to tell the truth, and this is yeah. just my experience, it was a put down. Like a bus driver with a good character and integrity, a hardworking man is not good enough for her because she expects her happiness or her whatever to come from a man. And I know that now that conversation has shifted and it's become about her, her promoting and supporting excellence. I do that too. I support yeah. excellence in my black, but that's not what we were talking about. That is not what we were talking about. And so I was just reading her energy and what I, what I heard and I've heard, I'm not just focusing on Ebony now, from many women. I mean, I've been doing 50 episodes of the R-Spot. I talk to women every single week. And what I hear is their 
expectation, demand, and reliance on another human being to make them happy and provide for their needs. And see me, God is my source and my supply. A man is the gravy, he ain't the potatoes. <laughs> and so I heard in that she wanted him to be the potatoes, the chicken, the crisp on the chicken skin, and was really kind of demanding how he had to fry the chicken. <laughs> it was just Which demanding. Did, did, did it come across as demeaning to you? It did. I'm sorry. I, I know she says now that was not her intention. I know she says now that. And I believe if she had thought about it again, she may not have said it that way because she said only if he owned the bus. And my first thought was, well, damn, I want him to own the bus company. Because if that one bus go down, we jacked up, <laughs> you know, but I didn't get into that because we were talking about, again, the context of the hardness, the toughness, the masculine drive. Really, I would that kind of energy for me is what a man would think about or look for in a woman who's going to mother his children, who's going to keep his house, who's going to help him build the legacy. That's what a man looks for, a woman who's yeah, going to bring... listen, that, was, that was pretty unattractive from where I was sitting. Um, <laughs> she, she has since said that um, she's described people who work in such jobs as uh, mediocre and succumbing to the low expectations of racism. I was surprised to be very honest with you because when I watched the entirety of your interview, it really, the, the conversation or the comment that she made about the bus company or the bus, owning the bus, was really a very small part of it. I actually saw in her opportunities, uh, attempts at empathy, uh, attempts at reflection in, in her, in that. Since that time, uh, in subsequent conversations, she seems to be marrying um the conversation around high expectations, which is totally whatever she's subscribed to as high expectations. And what Envy, if you can just excuse the term for a second, but DJ Envy called shitting on uh, the working class and trying to get her to understand that, look, I, I as women go, I, I don't see skinny as my, my thing, right? I don't look like, wow, she's size one. That's, but I don't need to say that size ones are ugly. Or, right. or, or, or mediocre or average, right? Or, or it, and so it sounds now that she has taken what she believes to be excellent and using herself as the, um, the yardstick for the acquisition of excellence, right? So if you're excellent, you get to be with her because she's the prize. But you know, again, e even that, I think here's the, here's the thing, loving with conditions. I see it in the thread right now. People talking about you want, you like black men better than black. What are you talking about? We're human beings. And I wanna go to, uh, what is it? Uh, Funky Deneva said it, the best. We all want the same thing. We wanna be loved. We wanna be valued. We wanna be accepted. We wanna be uh, uh, connected heart to heart, soul to soul. But if it's about how much money you make and what kind of job you do and what kind of frills and, and things, what about not just coming together as people? And if women have that level of hardness in their heart, if they have that level of hardness in their heart, where if you're a bus driver or you got on work boots or you, you, you dig a grave or drive a truck, you can't do for me, how, how what's going to happen? I think well, it's a combination of all things. But my primary thing, Steve, is women showing up in the world as masculine and not feminine from their head and not their heart, from their intellect and not their intuition. And that is killing the world. Here's my question. You can answer this. If we want men of status, whatever that is, or men who make a lot of money, how are we raising our sons? And what if our son's soul is not corporate, lawyer, doctor? What if it's artisan? What if it's entrepreneur? What if his soul's drive and his spiritual purpose is to be a drummer or, 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 or an artist? You know, he may never reach social status. 
But how do we raise a male and how do we encourage our sons, our brothers, our husbands when their soul is not directed toward this social corporate status? What do we do with that as well? well so uh, one of the places that I think we need to start is acknowledging that words hurt and no one, male or female, wants to be demeaned for what they do for a living. No one wants to be told that they're mediocre or underachieving, as she has said, um, because of their vocation. And yeah. that, and I, and I think that there's, I, let me just preface this. I don't care who sleeps with who, <laughs> period. As long as they're adults, I don't care who and how many that is on them. I have too many other things that, to worry about than who's Zoom and who, as Aretha used to say. That is not my thing. Where I jump into this conversation is when I watch a black woman use a platform that she will have, but no one has forever, to push the politics of Paramore as a um, destruction of the very people that I have the the pleasure, the honor of working with every day, many of whom are poor and on the come up. That's where I jump in. That's where I'm. That's where I gotta throw a flag on the play. Because I don't get what she doesn't understand about the way she's talking and what she's how she's arriving in the world. For me, when I watch somebody tear other people down because of what they do for a living or don't do for a living, at the same time as they then go and, and marry or be engaged to a white man, but trying to do so in a space where they are talking about black people, then what is excellent to you? Because to me, a white guy who does well isn't necessarily extraordinary. A brother who does well, whatever well is for him, is extraordinary knowing all the circumstances that he's got to go through just to get to zero. Wouldn't it be nice if we as black men start out at zero, just, just zero, and then got to move forward from there? So the, the energy of which you speak to me is far more global than yeah. just determination of who you want to be with when you are damning other people, and you are, because you, you, we all heard the same thing. We heard you say what you said. But, but they're doing it right now, talking about why am I asking women to lower their standards? I'm not trying to figure out how do you create a standard? How do you no, do that? But, that? but that's not even a conversation. Here's the deal, because I guess all of them are super dope making tons of money, and they're going to have it, and they got generational wealth, because last time I checked, my black ass could lose my job. So I'm not going to walk around all haughty talking about where I am or what, just because I got a degree or two or three, whatever that means to somebody. And in by way of, of, of a system that says that these are the things that matter, come on. There are certain jobs that pay more than other jobs. If, if you work at a certain institution and you do something, you'll make more. It doesn't mean you have a higher status. Why are we even having that conversation? This is a person who you're going to spend your intimate space with. That's right. That's where I want to get to. Like for me, I was standing yesterday. I, I, yesterday, I'm coming home on a train, and I'm standing next to this brother. And he's filthy, straight up filthy. Uh, he's got his yellow uh, penny on, which like he was clearly working outside or somewhere. But I mean, he was dirty. Like you know, not like you know, whatever. So I'm standing next to him. He's standing, he's sitting down. He's got his elbows on his um. He's got his forearms on his thighs. His head is just down. He just looks spent, like, whoa. He works hard. His phone rings, right? Mm -hmm. And when his phone rings, I'm so close to him, it catches my attention as it catches his attention. It's a FaceTime. The caller ID says, love of my life. <laughs> this dirty man on the train. <laughs> love of my life. When that love of my life opened up, it was what appeared to be his wife and his daughter. And their faces lit up together. You mean to tell me you don't want that man answering your phone? <laughs> you, you, you don't, that's not who you want to call? You don't want to call him? Because yeah. he's dirty? Are we serious right now? Yeah. No, I'm not that. For me, one of the problems that we have is that people are taking their professional life and injecting it into their personal life. No one cares where you went to school when they're trying to date you. Get over yourself. You're playing yourself. What they care about is how you care about them. You could become really quickly unattractive to many men, many yeah. men who don't want to hear that. Nobody wants to come to their crib and compete. What are you thinking? That's not what we're talking about. No one cares what you did like you did. Like, I got this. I got that. 
Think about this for a second. You're trying to build a heart together. Yes. You're yes. trying to, and, and if you know, like I do, jobs are going to ebb and flow. Sometimes you're winning. Sometimes she's winning. But as long as we're working together, we're getting to that next place. I, today, we had college signing day at one of our schools. And one, you know, one of the young people, he's going to a particular college and one and the principal said, pulled me aside. He said, you know, the story is not that 100 percent of these kids have gotten into four year colleges. He said, the story is, do you know that young man? He said, he said, you see, he's got two bags over there. I said, yeah. He said, you know, two bags of four. I said, I, I do not. He said every day after school, he takes all of the bottles and cans that his classmates have discarded and he brings them home. Mm. His father is mediocre. That man's father's mediocre. Really? Well, that young I, man was a mediocre person to you? Come I, I guess it. Wh when did that happen? You know, uh, I, I mean, I've dated. I was I was married to I dated a New York City transit conductor. <laughs> he was a conductor. This was way before I was Yama Van Zandt. And, you know, people go into this. Well, you rich, you can do that and blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what you're talking about. You're rich. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, but I won't even get into that. Um, uh, and. While we were together, he was a conductor. After we broke up, he became a motorman and a supervisor, and he's now retired. <laughs> but right. we, I met him on a boat ride, leaving out of 43rd Street in New York. And we connected. We connected. And it didn't matter to me. So I'm just wondering, and particularly as women, if we go into this dating scene or we go into mating with looking at what what you what you can give me and what you can do for me and 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 competing at the mind level. That's just, it right there. That's it. Let me just say let me just say this. As as a as a man, who talks to other men? Let me tell you the way this spring breaks down. You he comes home to you where you're telling him all the things he's not. Yeah. He goes to work. Meet somebody who tells him all the things that he is. Right. Here's a simple one. Here's a simple one, because anyone who you've seen who's had a long term relationship, 30, 40, 50 years, they let the ego thing go. Anybody's been married for any length of time, like real time, like 30, 40, 50 years. That's real marriage. Like that's a real long time. There are things that they have put up with, gone through that they would never share with you because this is not a community project. This is their relationship. But right. let's just say that a way to engage one another, because men got a lot of work to do, too. But we're talking right now and then we'll get to that in a moment. But if you have someone who is aware of your shortcomings and your challenges and makes you feel like you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof, they're going to be the most attractive person to you. That person who you didn't think was so cute before, you think, OK, she thinks I'm cute. I think she's cute, too, because right. she makes me feel like I'm somebody. The same way that y'all raise your sons, the same way that you engage your sons and tell them how they're all amazing when they ain't that amazing, the same way that you tell them that they can get over it and the things that they can go. Your partner needs that same level of encouragement. And you telling him that he doesn't, he's underemployed is the best way to make sure that he never feels like he is the man of the house. He never feels like he's powerful. And mm -hmm. what is it that you want to do? Because sis, you, you acknowledge this as, as somebody who runs schools in Bridgeport, in Harlem, in the Bronx, and used to run schools in Hartford. I see so many women show up pure aggression, pure, mm -hmm. I mean, straight up willing to fight when, wait, whoa, hey, hey, let's just talk. Like, let's start with the conversation. And I think it's in part because many of them have been hurt by men in their lives, whether it be fathers, uncles, grandfathers. A lot of men have done a lot of bad things to girls. A and lot. I want to say women have done a lot of bad things to men, but you got to get into the relationship first. You got to get into the relationship. And if I'm dismissing you because you're a bus driver or a truck driver or UP. We can't even get into the relationship or... Yep. I come into the relationship thinking I lowered my standards to, to be with you. I'm always going to have that in the back of my mind because women don't understand what we hold in our heart. We manifest in our experience. Don't bleed on me if I didn't cut you. 
<laughs> if I'm not the one who did this to you, don't put this on me. If you got an issue with your father, that's on him. Your uncle, that's on him. But me, this I didn't do this to you. Give me the opportunity to establish myself in your life. If I'm constantly working against the waves, swimming upstream, I get out the water. I get out the water. There's somebody else out here. And this notion that someone's asking you to lower your expectations, what are you talking about? What does that even mean to you? Someone well, saying, I don't want you to love you for you? That's lower to you? Because that's what I want to know. I, I want to know that. And let me just be real clear here because I'm very sensitive to energy and people are making this about me tearing Ebony down. This is not about me tearing Ebony down. I about her a while ago. That out there. This is not about that. I have a different perspective than she does. She have a different perspective than I do. And I'm also real clear that right now, the conversation that she and other people are having is not the conversation that we were having. So don't put that out there that I'm coming for Ebony. This is not even about Ebony. Here's the question. Love with conditions. Do we use status, position, and income as a, a, a requisite for dating and mating. Now, here's a question, Steve. Is it possible when it comes just to dating as women, because we are in our minds, in our intellect so very often and not in our heart? Because as a woman, I can feel when a man is, you know, balanced. Is it that so many women don't know what an emotionally healthy, available man looks like? So we use status and income as criteria. Is, is it because we don't believe we can get a good man, we look for a successful man? I think it's I think it's something in between there. I think that for a lot of women who speak like that, because I don't, that's not the group that I typically travel with in any way, any parts of my life. But what I hear when I run across said group leads me to believe that they're lacking something inside themselves. They want to be able to show up to the Jack and the Jill they want to be able to show up to the gala. They want to be able to show up, show up to the boule and, and brag because for some, there's something about them that they feel like they need from that person that he somehow, and, and they say, no, 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 no. I, I'm just saying I want someone to be equal. I don't know if that's an issue of equity because equity can be found in many different ways. It, there's, we're talking about uh, uh, distilling equity to a single part, which is what you do for a living, which is where you work, which changes throughout the course of your life. And if you know anything, if you, for instance, are an entrepreneur, you watch your, your fates dip and, and, and soar. And, and if you are someone who started your own thing or you're working somewhere, you watch these things ebb and flow. The only people who have a constant trajectory, quite frankly, are the very people that we're talking about, which are those blue collar people. There's a consistent flow of their career. So I find that the women who, and maybe men too, but I, since we're talking about women, those people who assign value to what someone does for a living are themselves lacking said value. They need someone or something to make them feel like they are somehow accomplished. And that to me is a problem because fates change, jobs come and go. People lose their job. Disney's hiring, uh, firing 10,000 people, some ridiculous number like that. Google, thousands of people. So what? Now those people don't, they're no longer valuable to their partner. That's, that's what we're setting up here. And at the same time that we're doing that, we're damning people who are making decisions that are different than, than what we believe, what, what, what you think you need in order to feel valuable. This is not about relationships. This to me is about showing the rest of the world that you matter. Being able to show up with the doctor or the lawyer. Like for, who walks around telling people that they're an attorney when no one's asked you that question? Who, who tells people where you went to college when it wasn't even a point of the conversation? Why are you leading with this? Why does that matter? If we're not having a legal conversation, why are we talking about your law school experience? If, we're, if, if it's not in that setting, similarly, why do we need to know where you clerked? Why do we need to know where you uh, 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 where you work? Like these are not relevant to the basic human friendships. When two people, and we think of it this way, when two people are at the gym and they form a friendship, they form a friendship based upon the fact that they're both at the gym, 
and then they fall in friendship because they're both mothers. And then they both get there at the same time. And then the friendship grows. And then if one person finds out that she cleans houses, another one person finds out she needs a house cleaned. That doesn't mean this person is above this person. That means y'all just found a partnership. Yo, you clean houses? I need my house clean. We have a friendship. We have a partnership. That's what we should be thinking of it as. Now, to the term of evenly yoked, you, the house cleaner, me, the person who needs a house clean, we need to work together. You, the mother, me, the mother, you need somebody to watch your son. I watch your son because he's the same age as my son. We should be looking to find commonality, not to destroy one another because we don't have the same level of income. But I still, I'm still lost in this. Listen, everybody has a right to their preferences and standards. Like I said, you can date whoever you want. You can sleep with whoever you want. You can want him, you know, I personally like chocolate ball with a beard. But then <laughs> I've done Puerto Rican <laughs> and straight hair. I've done that too, okay? So everybody has their preferences. What I'm saying is, when those preferences become the only measuring stick, would you dismiss someone of good character and quality, a good ingredient, because they came in a brown paper bag instead of, you know, golden tissue paper? That's the piece that I Mitchell, don't like. Hey, and, and for me, it's not even about men this and women that. I'm talking about how we as human beings have degraded our evaluation and assessment of each other now based on income and based on, like you said, frills. That's what I'm talking about. And for women, it's because we live in our heads and we are neck down dead. We don't There's trust neck down anymore. We don't trust our hearts. We've been talked out of it, conditioned out of it, programmed out of it. And so a, a man who would, who would treasure and value our heart, we dismiss because he's driving a bus. There's a yes. woman who I dated when I was uh -huh. in graduate school. There was a woman I dated in graduate school. And I mean, we dated, if we dated a month, it's more longer than I think we did. But <laughs> almost immediately, she started talking about the kind of ring that she wanted. And and I didn't, I mean, I was 16 months out of the housing project. So I didn't know what she taught, like a ring she meant. And so she's talking about this ring and she's talking about VCRs, VCR. I don't know what you, what, I don't know anything. Still don't know that. Like letters that go with diamonds, I guess, is there things that go with that, right? Cuts and colors and what have you. And as she talked, and this is the truth. As she talked about what she valued, again, this is me, not anyone else. As she talked about what she valued, and here I am, somebody who at the time was a social work school, working in Philadelphia's public schools, working with some of the poorest children on earth. And she's saying that she's actually becoming less attractive to me. Actually, she, the, the more she becomes she's describing more, a diamond, she's, talking, she's describing a diamond. I'm thinking she I mean, her face is literally breaking in front of me. And I'm thinking, wow, she's just not even pretty anymore. And I don't want to talk to her anymore because we clearly are in a different space. When I said to my wife before she became my wife, I asked her, what would you say if I tied a blade of grass around your finger? She said, I would wear a blade of grass. And for a long time, that's all I could have afforded was a blade of grass. And there have been times in my career where it's been up and it's been down. And blades of grass was all I had access to. And what kind of person wants to feel like their value ebbs and flows like the stock exchange in their bedroom? Who wants to feel like that? Think of the message that you're sending. It's not about lowering your expectations. It's about being humane towards people. The conversation and standards. I mean, if let me tell you, I'm, I'm gonna tell you two private personal stories. Okay. First, when when I got married, um, I wasn't the Ian Levan Zant of you know fixing my life and whatever. I had a couple of books out, and my life, my career. I had been doing the work for like 20 years, but unless people see you on TV or hear you on the radio or go on Oprah, they dismiss you. You know, people, oh, the lady from Oprah. No, baby, I was doing the work 20 years before I got on Oprah, and that's the same thing we do to bus drivers. I think and and, and trash people. I think sometimes they can't even feel the value of the service they offer because we put them down and we dismiss them. Before yeah. you tell your story, can I just jump in here? I'm going to tell you something about you that you, did, you don't know that about you and me. So in 1992, I lived in Philadelphia and I played on, oh, a, on a 
<laughs> I lived in Philadelphia in 1992. And um, I had, I was on a men's football team. And most of the brothers who were on this men's football team were the men who we're talking about, who work different jobs. Acts of Faith came out in what year? Um, 92, 91. This, watch, watch how the story goes. One brother on the team got Acts of Faith. He bought 30, 40 of the Acts of Faith himself. The little purple one. <laughs> the purple one. The little purple one. He was a bus driver. He came and handed them out to all of us at football practice. <laughs> you were speaking into men who were still, most of us were still single. We were still trying to figure out who we were. You were building us up even before you met us. Wow. Listen, I, I, two things I want to say. One is I think a man has to be able to provide. For me, I have the four P's. Provide, protect, perform, and please. That's it. You got to be able to do that. But let me tell you how, how, I, how I lived that. When I got married and I wasn't Eon LeVan Sand, I was just growing into that. And my husband did not earn the kind of money that I was earning at the time. And we talked about it, you know, when she makes more than him. And we came up with a really workable plan and how we were going to do. He was going to do this. He was going to do that. And we were both going to add a percentage to our joint bank account to handle our household. Even though the amount I put in was more, the percentage was the same. We were each going to give 75% of whatever we earned. So if my 75% was 10,000 and his was 3,000, that's okay because we were on equal footing adding the same percentage. And I really, I could, you know, I was making nice money. And what I didn't have to put in the house, I tucked over in the side. Well, I was, I'm a Christmas person. I love the Christmas tree. I love, not because of the religious or the commercial aspect. I just like the way it looks and feels and sounds. So we decide, he's a Kwanzaa person, grassroots, community organizer. He does Kwanzaa, I did Christmas. So this is what we decided. He would support me with Christmas. I would support him with Kwanzaa. He would buy the Christmas tree and take care of all of that. And I would buy the Kenora and the candles and set up the Kwanzaa and the Zawadi for the kids and everything. Okay. So this one particular Christmas, I'm driving along and I see this Christmas tree of life. Okay. Big 10 foot spruce. We got 12 foot ceilings. I mean, this thing was divine. This was many, many years ago. And I jumped out my car and I went over to the man and I'm sniffing the tree and licking it, and, you know, because <laughs> I'm into Christmas trees. And I asked him how much it was. And he said, $80. I said, please hold this tree for me. Please hold this tree for me. Now, in my mind, I said, I can't even give you a deposit because my husband has to come and buy it. Please hold this tree for me. I'm going to go home right now and get my husband to come buy this Christmas tree. And he said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. It was early. So I go home and I'm all excited. And I say, look, babe, I found the tree. I found the tree. You know the place? And he said, OK, how much is it? I said, $80. He said, I ain't paying no $80 for no Christmas tree. <laughs> and I'm like, but I, I love the tree. Why? You said you would get the tree. Yeah, I'll get the tree, but I'm not paying no $80 for a Christmas tree. Now, in my mind, as the, you know, the money earner, I can afford an $80 Christmas tree. I want the $80 Christmas tree. And I'm trying to uh, adhere to our agreement. So the next day, he went out and came back with a Kwanzaa bush. <laughs> <laughs> this little thing, I don't think the, the tree was. I, I, I didn't know you had, had a Kwanzaa bush. I, I know about the Kwanzaa bush. Okay. Right? It was a Kwanzaa bush. And so I looked at that and I'm like, well, what is that? He said, it's the tree. And I said, uh, you know, in my arrogant, masculine, competing, dominating mind, in my mind, I said, I ain't touching that thing. So the next day, I went out. And I paid $80 and brought the tree home and dragged it into the house. He came downstairs and he looked at it. Ooh, I can still feel it in my spirit. Steve, he didn't say a word. You crushed him. Of his spirit. Oh, you crushed him. I'm telling you he now. Crushed. 
I bet you to this day he remembers that Christmas. It put the first nail in the in the coffin of my marriage. That was one thing. And as I said before, you know, I've had many non-sexual men, male friends. He wasn't non-sexual. That was my husband. But men have taught me how to be a woman because my father didn't. But my friends, my male friends, here's another situation. Yama Van Zen, I'm traveling, flying all over. And my partner of 13 years, a beautiful man, never, we never had an argument, not once in 13 years. He just passed away two years ago. Um, he took me to the airport. He got out the car, was coming around. By the time he got around, I was out the car. And now I'm opening the door to get my suitcase out the back seat. He grabbed my hand and I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? And he looked me in my face and he said, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me ever. And in that moment, oh my God. So now if you're a man in my life <laughs> and you don't take my bag out the car, I'm done with you. Bye. I'm out. <laughs> okay. No, no you're, talking about me. you're talking about energy. You're talking about that there's a yin and yang. You're talking about how people come together and, and how they show up to the world. And, and what I hear you talking about is how you recognize that in men, many men, that there is a desire to be a provider. If and, there is. And quite frankly, if it's not, it doesn't matter if that man is an attorney, a PhD, or no D. That person is a problem. That will be a lowering of standards. A person who doesn't value you that's a lowering of standards and that cannot well, yeah. be discerned by job. Listen, listen, here's the piece. And I can own this. I thank God I've healed it because we did at some point, I think every woman at some point either relied on or depended on a man to provide, to protect and to support. And he didn't. And the same way I crushed my husband's spirit with that Christmas tree, our spirit as women gets crushed when men fail to show up in their bigness, in their greatness, providing, yeah. protecting. And then I think what happens, and this is where I, the work that I do, I think that what happens is we carry that disappointment, that, that anger, that hurt, that, you know, that betrayal into our hearts. We carry it in our hearts and then we do something else so that that never happens to us again. But that's you where know? the job conversation yeah. comes in. But that, that's where the job, the, the belief yes. is yes. that if I find someone that I would hire, then I have somehow mitigated the likelihood of finding a deadbeat. And I'm saying <laughs> that deadbeats come in all degrees, in all complexions, in all parts of the world. And I'm also saying you don't have to poop on people who don't have what you believe to be high earning potential to say that you have a preference. Two things can happen and, and men can and must continue to work to become the men who we want to be treated as. I'm not suggesting that some sister comes into the crib, sees a man with his feet up, ain't doing nothing, ain't been nowhere and treat him like the so-called king. I don't yeah. care what his CV says, I don't care how many people he's worked with or for. I don't even care how much money he brings into the house. What we're missing is the important part of this. We're talking about a relationship. This first. is a first. first. This is an yeah. emotional relationship. Whatever foolishness you dealt with in your past, learn from it. But don't let that be what dictates the way you talk to and listen to other people. It is a very ugly feeling to be a man who's listening to you talk to him like you talk to somebody else. Like, yo, I didn't talk to you like that. I don't treat you like that. So don't talk to me this way. And now I'm saying not even as a romantic person. I'm saying even as an educator, when I deal with moms, for instance, who come in there and talk to me all reckless and foul, yo, 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 I don't know who treated you like that but since you've been in this building nobody talked to you like that nobody right. talks to you like that so that energy you leave that shit out on the street because nobody here is interested in that nobody nobody wants because because your head would explode if i talked to you like that 
But that's the piece that I want uh, my sister women to understand. Yes, we've been hurt. Yes, we've been disappointed. Yes, we've been betrayed. But you know what, Steve? I'm only going to attract a certain kind of man. I don't care what his job is. Energetically, I spent nine years in a relationship with a man, six foot four, 260 pounds, who whipped my ass every other day. Broke my jaw when I was six months pregnant. They couldn't even wire my jaw. So they tied my head up like, like, you know, with gauze. They couldn't wire my jaw because I was six months pregnant. I couldn't get anesthesia. Yeah, I lived through that. I was raped at nine, pregnant by a man and by a, a teenager at 16 who never took care of his son, ever. And still, I'm vibrating at a certain place for myself, not for a man. So certain men can't even get it. I, I'm not going to attract a man who only wants to pay, play video games. I'm not going to attract a man who's, who's going to lie to me. I'm not going to attract a man who's going to beat me. And this is what I want women to understand. If you up your internal game, your external game will follow suit. It won't matter what kind of money he makes. You will attract the man that's going to fulfill your soul. And when your soul is fulfilled as a whim, woman, you're not going to look at a paycheck. You're going to look at integrity. You're going to look at honor. You're going to look at accountability. These are, let's be real, Steve. If you right now today, as a PhD social worker in the world, would you be a good catch in a transactional relationship for, for, for let's say, uh, in the world today, the VP of a bank? Or, 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 or the VP of that's a great of question. And, and if that's you a great were question. working in the city, in the state social work department, where single moms go to get help, where mental health uh, people, where the who most money I could make is a hundred and maybe hundred ten thousand dollars, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe, and maybe. people would dismiss you because you, 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 you're. you're, you're let me listen. <laughs> the, money, like, the most amount of money I could make, quite frankly, in that setting, in that public service setting, would be about what a corrections officer could make, about what a probation officer could make, about what a bus driver could make, about what a cop could make. Our top salaries, despite our degrees, are set at the same because that's how we pay public employees, right? right. That's how we pay people to serve us. That's how we pay them. So to your question, that's a great question. So what, I got to come in and tell people I went to an Ivy League school? Like, so do, when, when do I get invited back? Like, it, this, is, this is what makes the conversation so cruel. We're painting people with an unfair brush. You should be looking for someone who makes you feel good about yourself. I think we're painting ourselves with an unfair brush. That's that that's Where's that the unfair brush? I'm a successful woman. I'm an independent woman. I'm a financially stable woman. That's today, how we ourselves. Today, today. And, then, and then no, that I'm, I don't paint myself. You know what? No, I mean? no, not, not you. I'm saying that's how they can call themselves that today. I think if we start there, painting ourselves as I'm successful, I got my own home, I drive a Benz, a Porsche, whatever. If we start there, then that's when we're going to be looking for a a economic match. And our vibration as women are off because we're looking at X. You know what I am? I am first and foremost a servant of God. That's me. That's my standard. So I don't care if you are a bus driver, a cop, a lawyer, a judge, a FBI agent. Do you have a personal relationship with God? That's the first thing I want. Can I give it to you a different way? Can I give it to you? Can I, can I just flip this really quickly? Just really quickly. So what we're okay. missing is, is what we're doing is we're missing something really big in this in this conversation. It's very big. So if you are ambitious and you are traveling the world and you are doing the things that you're going to do, right? And we decide that we want to have children. Who's going to take care of the kids? Right. So what we should be looking at is what do we have in common? You want children? I want children. You're ambitious. I support your ambition, right? I support your ambition. So when you're off in East Jabip trying to save souls, who's, yeah, right. going, to, 
who's going to be back in Maryland picking the kids up and taking the dogs well, to the My husband was. I, I was raising my so kids. So does that make him less? Or are you a partnership house cleaner? House needs to be cleaned, right? We're missing yeah. this in a very big way. The very big point here is if you are out, literally, and I'll, tell, I'll just share with you the space that I'm in right now. I've traveled, as you know, quite a bit. Well, wait a minute, hold that. And let me go ahead and open up the phone lines. All right. Let me go ahead and open up the phone lines so that people can start calling in and then we can get other people involved in here. Um, and, and yeah, all right. So the, the numbers well, on this screen, really, really, if you I'll have a question, really comment, I, call in 775-307-7768. It's right there on the screen. So go ahead, Steve. While I, have folks are calling. I have a colleague who's an attorney um, and her husband stayed home. Is he less than? Is that what, it, does that make him less than? I don't think so. They made a decision. This is valuable to us to make sure that a child, that our children are, are in home with at least one parent. This is my job that allows me to do this. So you'll do that. We work together. Yes. And our spending is based upon what we put in together. These yes. are our resources, but our values are greater than the financial contribution that we make to the family. And that's yeah. the point. Our values are more than how much we put into the bank account. We put into the whole of the family. I want, I, you know, again, this conversation is not about deny. Let me say this. For those who are just turning in, <laughs> tuning in, I am Yamla. This is the R Spot. My guest today is Dr. Steve Perry. And we're talking about the question heard around the world. Would you date a bus driver that has taken on all kinds of legs and wings and feet and fangs and everything? And I want to say again that this is not about me uh, uh, disagreeing with or arguing with or putting down my soror sister, Ebony K. Williams. It's really about the context of the conversation she and I were having, which is um, the, the quality of men that are available for women and how women are being in the world today. That's my sole context. Y'all can put whatever words you want to put in my mouth. If you think I'm asking you to lower your standards, if you think I'm softer on men than on women, if you think that I'm tearing up Ebony, that's because your listening is off and you're probably by yourself and don't have a relationship. <laughs> I'm not saying none of that. Here is my context. Women are showing up in the world as masculine. And I understand why, my beloved sisters, I've been there. I've been there, angry, mean, tough, hard in my intellect, denying my intuition, dismissing my power, being aggressive. I've been there. And what I'm saying is, for us as women, when we're there, we'll use status and income as as criteria for dating and mating. And what I want us to do is to clean up our insides and to live from our power and our intuition. And I promise you, I promise you, you will attract the man who will make your heart sing or the partner. Because I know gay couples, the same thing. I have a wonderful uh, two men, they're married, they adopt the children. One is a high powered, uh, higher education exec. The other one stays home with the kids. And they I just decided that. that. You understand? Yes, Everybody yes. can't be gone at the same time. Everybody yes. can't be gone from the house at the same time. This is just a fact of life. It's a fact of life. When you're making a decision of a partner and a partnership, somebody, someone has to be home to meet the UPS driver. Somebody right. has to be home to make sure that the bills get paid. <laughs> Some, somebody walked the and that's not a lower position at all. One isn't lower than the other. If we're working together, that's called a partnership. And in the partnership yeah. is where we get to create the relationship. If we, right. it's just friends, even friends. If I'm the kind of person who always has to talk and you're the person who always wants to listen, we probably have a great friendship. But if two people are always talking, they probably won't get along. And for women, I, I again, not only always talking, but how we talk, how we talk, not just to men, but to each other. Our I kids. mean, I, that's why I don't do social media because the level of meanness that I see and the level of, I've seen it right here in this thread today. Don't tell me what I'm saying. 
I'm, you know, Absolutely. let me just say this to y'all. I, 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 y'all got to be very mindful about how you come for me because I have an alter ego named Grandma Snookums and she will eat your face off. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I want to say that for a second because, you, you know, one, if you came to be disrespectful, go somewhere else because nobody needs that energy. So that's number one. Number two, because we can have a conversation about the, without being disagreeable. And number we can two, disagree. But number two, where I why I have engaged in this part of the conversation is because I've heard, I've heard the the degradation of an entire class of people, and that doesn't feel right. That's that's where I think all of us, especially as Black people, need to jump in and say, "Hey, okay, 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 date who you want to date. Don't date who you don't want to date. Right. But don't destroy. Don't." poop on an entire class of people. That's not okay. That's not okay. And if you're hearing anything other than that, you're dealing with your own stuff. And let's be honest, a lot of y'all flexing like you got it like that. I don't even know what you think like that is. They got <laughs> a little girl at one at our school in the Bronx. She came over to me. She asked me if I was rich. And I had to think about it. And let me tell you why I had to think about it. Because I know rich people and I'm like, actually, no. Not in no. money. <laughs> not, not, not yeah. like, no, I know rich people Me too. And, and you and I know this and this is where I find this funny part as well people see people on television or on whatever the thing that they watch people on <laughs> let me be clear I have paid for more than a few of those people's dinners and lunches they ain't rich I'm telling you right now and if they rich they're selfish not economically. No, I'm not, not rich that. economically but I'm wealthy you know why I have a village of people who love me and support me. I have men like you in my life that I can come to. And I've called you. We've talked about things. I have other men that I have non-sexual relationships with that I can say, okay, help me see this rightly. I have women who call me up. Did you eat today? Or what are you doing? Yeah, don't wear that no more. Don't do that no more. I, to me, that is wealth. That is wealth. So let me just be real clear again. This is not about who Ebony's dating. This is not about who you date. This is not about your standards. I, you can date who you want to. You can be with who you want to. My question is simply, are your standards and your requirements, A, would your father meet them? B, mm. how do you train your son to meet them? And C, are they getting you what you want? Because we all want, thank you, uh, uh, Diva, Deneva, Funky Deneva, we all want the same things. We want to be loved and valued and accepted. We want companionship. This is about women learning to lead with their heart and not their intellect, honoring your intuition, honoring your inside, up-leveling your vibration so that you can attract the right person, not the person with the right salary, because the person with the right resume doesn't necessarily mean that's a right or a good person. I want the good ingredients, not necessarily a meal served on Good China. We've got callers on the phone, so I want to get them in. <laughs> and you please, what I want to say to you is get right to the heart of your question Get right to the heart of your question or your comment so we can take as many people here on this season finale episode of the R Spot. Uh, thank you all for tuning in, for listening. Caller, are you there? They're there. Hello, hello. Okay, good. If you're on the speaker, put the phone to your mouth, please. Let me Hello? hear you. Yes, yes, there you are. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? We can. We can hear you fine. Where are you calling from, beloved? Okay. I am calling from Dallas, Texas. Yay, Dallas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, thank you for allowing me to weigh in. My name is Kishana, and I'm hearing the conversation and, and been following the conversation from the first interview with um, with the Grio. And I I recognize that, like Ebony, I too have been 
never been in a romantic relationship where I have been protected and provided and loved properly. So I have shown up in relationships masculine myself. Mm. So to the question- Powerful awareness. And thank you for that. Thank you for owning that beautiful awareness. The question is, is that working for you? No, not at all. (laughs) Not you at all. Not at all. You are you are a really courageous, sister. I, I, if I can't just jump in here, for you to say that and acknowledge that, it just shows courage. And to be very honest with you, if if I'm a, if I'm a partner, if I'm a potential partner, and I hear you say that, I think you know what, I I would want to hear the rest of your conversation, I, because every one of us has got to grow, and and so many brothers have not shown up to do what we needed to do. So there are so many sisters who feel like they have to do everything. They anticipate opening the door and standing on the outside and, 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 and taking their car to get uh, the, all the fluids filled. They just think that you just like, that's something that they got to do because they've always done it. So why, why leave room in your life for somebody to do it if they're not going to do it? But I hear you acknowledging that, I'm, you know what, I'm prepared to give that, give somebody that opportunity. Do you have a question, beloved? I, I did have a question. So to the, to your question first, would I date a bus driver? Absolutely. But for the bus drivers, for, for the everyday blue collar workers, how patient do you feel like they would be for a woman like myself that mm. is trying to grow and trying to learn mm. from showing up in not so positive ways and making that turn and, and now realizing that I do need to be better at being in my feminine and working on my areas of opportunity? How patient do you think they would be with me? Because the same way... I would date a bus driver. Would they date someone that's working on themselves? Beautiful. Thank you. Get up and listen to the answer, beloved. I hope all the bus drivers, truck drivers, taxi drivers out there heard this beautiful sister's question. Would you be patient with her as she unlearns and relearns how to be feminine as opposed to masculine because of the way she's been treated in relationships? So I want a bus driver, truck driver, or Uber driver. Call me and let me know. I can't answer that for you. I won't be arrogant enough. But here's what I will say from my work on myself in the world and on the R spot. Very few of us know how to do relationships. And the same way we want the men to show up this way with the goods and the, the, the men want us to show up. The men want us to show up in a certain way. Now they have to speak to what that is and why that is. But I think we all need. So for you bus drivers, cab drivers, Uh, doctors, lawyers, judges, police officers out there, when you meet a sister, a woman who is trying to relearn or unlearn things that she's learned because of her disappointments, we're asking for patience. We're asking for patience, you know, and what that looks like. And don't discard us because we've got issues. Some of y'all have issues. Some of y'all got monogram luggage. <laughs> yeah, I want to just give a shot, a, a shot on, on some of this. Uh, it's just, I think everyone can hear the authenticity and sincerity in, in uh, her voice. She's not saying that she's a, a mess or that she's perfect. She's saying she's like the rest of us, just trying to get right. And I think you attract the energy that you that you send out. And if you are sending out the energy of somebody who's authentically looking for their their best self, I think that you attract that energy back. What somebody does for a living, you'll find out through conversations afterwards. But but what they do for a life, which means the way that they they pay their debts and and they they will be more than patient. Patient people will be patient with people who want to be better. It doesn't matter what they do for a living. Good. Do we have another caller out there? Thank you so much, beloved Dallas, Texas, for calling in. We have another caller. So much, beloved. Thank you. Where are you calling from, beloved? I'm calling from Chicago, Illinois. Shy towns in the house. Okay, you got a question or a comment? Uh, yes, thanks so much for having me. So my question is, um, why is it, how can I word this? So when a woman decides that, hey, I do want a man with integrity, who's kind, who's hardworking, et cetera, et cetera, but I also have a particular amount of money that I want him to make. I do want my man to make $100,000 a year. 
why all of a sudden is the woman now considered a gold digger, superficial, or just because she also has a particular amount of money that she wants him to make as well. Do you consider yourself a gold digger? No. Okay, so then what do you care? <laughs> if you have that preference, okay. that standard, I want him to have integrity. I want him to take be nice to his mama and whatever. But in my book, he's got to make $100,000 because I know what I make. Just be aware that you may blow a really good brother who makes 75. Just be aware of that. You don't have to give up your standard. But also know that there may be one um, who who's making 75 that you'll blow. Can I, can I just jump in here for a second? Sure. It says, where does that number come from? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That's okay. Where does the $100,000 come from? Where does that number come from? Um, inflation, life, things cost. And I want to make sure that uh, we're able to live a pretty decent life. I'm not trying to live a luxurious life. I don't think $100,000 is going to make me live a luxurious life. I have a Birkin bag. I just want to make sure that will be okay. And also, I would like to have children. So, yeah. so essentially, and one more question, um, and, and answer this to the extent you feel comfortable. About how old are you? Oh, I'm 38. Okay. So if you, so then essentially you would say no to anyone who was a teacher, right? Who's no, first of all, teachers and hustlers, teachers usually have that job plus a tutoring side hustle plus whatever else they have going on. I wouldn't say no to a teacher. They're very ambitious. Okay. So the reason I asked that question is because in most cases, teachers, social workers who are about the same age that you are, are probably making in Chicago about fifty to $75,000 a year at best. So they're they're twenty five thousand dollars below. They're twenty five percent below your starting rate. Okay. And so yeah. that's why I asked the question. So it isn't now. We're not even so much just having a conversation about whether it's a bus driver or not. The reason I ask you a question about why the number, yeah, and I and I appreciate your answer is because there are entire classes of of people who you would otherwise likely respect and may because of your age, meaning you guys are a person who's thirty eight. Um, or so, or even 42, um, who, on, who's on a step program, who's in corrections, who's in a uh, police officer, who is sanitation, who is a teacher, who's a social worker, who's even a nurse, even a nurse, is not likely by 38 to be making $100,000. But I, I, I want to say I, I, I agree with Steve. I agree with Steve. And, you know, I was interested too in where that number came from, but I hear you. You want to be married. You want a decent life. You want to have children, and and that's fine, beloved. Hear me. I'm not, I'm not judging that. And if you up your energy, you'll attract a hundred thousand or even more. But I'm wondering, how do you find? When do you find that out? How? how when exactly do you find that out? Do you ask that? I, I'm I'm asking really from a place of sincerity now. When do you find that out? How do you find it out? I never ask. I never ask, but I think just through conversation and getting to know someone, they pretty much tell, um, you know, around about what they make and pretty much through their lifestyle, you know, if they're okay or if they're in the poor house or they're struggling. So I just don't want a man that's struggling. So okay. can I just go ask care you? Care that's a great point. Can I just give you just another wrinkle to just a, because how much a person makes is only part of the story is how much they keep, what their spending habits are, what their debt situation is. You can have, you can meet somebody who makes 170, 180, $200,000 is in debt up to their eyeballs. So I, I asked the question and I hope you hear the, the affection that uh, both sister Yala and I have for you and, and, and your vulnerability in answering the question. I asked the question about how much and where that number comes from. I also ask you how you the age you are, because contextually, that would essentially mean that you'd either end up dating someone who doesn't work in education, social work, college campuses and a lot of other places, all of whom are degreed and sometimes mastered or PhD. So those people all come out of the conversation, unless, of course, they're in their mid to late 50s, in which case they're likely not interested in having children. Right. So or they have children who are much older. So the reason why 
I ask this particular question is because sometimes we set an artificial expectation that can ultimately become a very real barrier. So I'd want you to think about what is it that you're actually looking for and how does it show up as a dollar amount? That's what I guess ultimately I'd want you to think about is if that's fair. Here's my question. Do you make a hundred thousand dollars? No, I don't make a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so now what? Of I don't all think it's a requirement not... for me to make a hundred thousand just to have a man that makes a hundred thousand. Oh wow! Okay. What, what about the men who want a woman who makes hundred thousand? <laughs> you won't be in their country. And I category. wouldn't be the woman for them. I wouldn't yeah. be for them. That's right. perfectly okay. And listen, oh, wow. I'm, I'm not telling you to lower it. I really thank you for sharing that because I I understand now and I hear you. See, for me as a woman, where I am in my soul and in my heart. I can create a healthy, strong, positive, loving relationship with a man who's going to provide, perform, protect, and please, who's going to be a good daddy to my children, and who's going to be good to me. I can create that and attract that as a woman, so much so that, and I believe it so much, I may meet him making 70000 but to make me happy, he'll take on a second job. You understand? So I just I just want to know, let, just want to share that at some point you may be you may miss him because he don't make a hundred thousand. But thank you for sharing. Thanks so much. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you, Steve, because I know you know, how do we get the dollar amount? How do we get the dollar? Yeah, because amount? in different places in the country, that number means nothing. San Francisco, hundred thousand dollars doesn't really mean anything. No. Really doesn't mean anything. So it's it's a number that I don't understand. And 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 I know that most of the people who most people interface with daily are nowhere near that, actually, and may never reach that in their professional lives. And many people would look at them and consider them role models in the community. They may be a, a mom, they may be a pastor, they may uh, be a minister. That's right. That's so right. And, just... and, and, and they ain't approaching. They, they're nowhere in the family. They ain't going to touch a hundred thousand. Not not in this life. Well, let me just say, I I spoke to someone right here on the R spot, uh, and she was in a relationship. She came into the relationship with two children, and within a very short amount of time, her and her partner had a child, and she was a stay at home mom, and he took care of everything. And I, I didn't know, I don't know how much money he made, but she was then upset because he didn't help her around the house. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you found a man, a working man, a BMW, a black man working, <laughs> who's ready, who's willing to take care of your two kids and the one that you have together. And you are a stay at home mom in the 21st century and you want him to wash a dish? I, well, I I think just, covered something also just in, me, I would yeah, that wouldn't I think be a something in, in, with a last caller and no disrespect to her, but you asking for something that you don't give. You have, you're asking for something you don't bring. What is it that is in you that's worth a hundred thousand dollars that you don't even bring? So to me, to me, when you with the same thing with the example that just used you you just used, it's the same thing. Here, you want more than you're contributing. And I don't see that that's an issue. Even in that, that's a transactional relationship. It's transactional. Yeah. It's transactional. And and when you de, you're always when you de, have a relationship with a man's income, you're gonna be disappointed. He, you yeah. Be disappointed. Let me go to my next caller. <laughs> caller, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Wait a minute. Get don't be on the speaker. Put your mouth to the phone and turn off the um your sound on your whatever you're hey, listening turn off to. The sound. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Where are you calling from, beloved? I am calling from the south. The south of what? <laughs> I'm originally from the Midwest. Okay. <laughs> okay, and you have a question, I. I love you so much. 
uh, I would not be where I am and who I am without you, even though we've only had a relationship through the television. <laughs> uh, your teaching has revelated and illuminated so many things in my mind that has caused me to make the necessary changes within myself so that the life that I want has manifested. And I just want to love you and thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, beloved. Did you have a question or a comment? Yes. So my, my comment and question has changed since the phone lines have opened because I felt uh, a, a way, but before you guys opened up the phone line, because I didn't understand the intent of the conversation, but the opening of the phone lines and your guys' comments have kind of helped me understand that what I thought was being said is not what was being said. Um, so I do want to answer the three things that, or two of them that I can remember that you said, did my father set the example and what am I putting into my son? Uh, to create the same. Um, right. And then furthermore, I also wanted to say that um, the focus, I agree with Dr. I can't see his name now on the screen. Dr. Perry. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Perry, sorry to me. Um, I definitely agree with what I think he's trying to say is that as women, I don't think we should focus on the necessary dollar amount that a man brings in, but I think the focus should be more on, okay, lady, who are you? What are you trying to accomplish in your life? What are you doing to get there? And what kind of partner do you need to be connected to to arrive there, however? And you need to stay in your wheelhouse and understand that you do have one-offs where women can land, you know, this guy who's rich or whatever. But in everyday normal life, you need to be equally yoked. And so don't have the expectation of a man to bring to the table what you're not bringing to the table is number one, is, is, is my opinion. And yes, my father, um, he was a chief, uh, chief of the fire department. He worked really hard. He made a lot of sacrifices also to help me become who I am today. And so I am still the same to my son that I don't know he's only 12. So we're still, you know, we still have a ways to go to figure out what his dreams and gifts and goals and talents are. But I raised my son that not to be mediocre. And I define mediocrity as any time you are showing up but you're not fully showing up. So you have more to give. You have more that you could be doing. You're not maximizing your gifts and talents and abilities. And so that's what I'm raising my son to do. And then the other, only other thing that I want to leave out here, which is very controversial, I feel, amongst women sometimes, is that sometimes you can meet a man when he's down, but that does, that's not the end of the story. Yeah. Ooh, that, but, you landed yeah, that, dude. Okay. Yeah. Let me just say this. Thank you, beloved for calling. And 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 I'm a mom and a grandma. You know, my I made my son get a job when he was 10. He had to walk a dog, he had to he had to deliver newspapers, he had to do something because I didn't want him to think that even as a young boy, as a young man, he was gonna be able to not carry his own weight. I've got five grandsons, five, one, two, three, four, five. One went to Tua in college. One probably wouldn't walk past the college if they paid him a million dollars. <laughs> he's, just, he's, he's just not, that's just not the guy he is. The two that I'm speaking about is I have one who is an absolute genius. He, this boy is an intellect, he is just, he's a technological genius. Yeah, he could work in any office, any company, anywhere at any time. And he's one of the young people that got caught up before Happy Flowers became legal and has that thing on his record. Can't get a job. Can't get a job because people look at a piece of paper and see possession of marijuana and literally not at McDonald's. Not, he, can, he can't get a job. And he is brilliant. So from people just looking at him, they dismiss him. I have another one who, another grandson who he's, he was, he had a, he had the experience of ADHD. So he's got to move and be busy. And he found out that he loves construction work. He wants to work with his hands and he loves the jackhammer. <laughs> and I'm like, that thing gonna shake your kidneys out, you know, but that's what he does. So when you see him, Young 30 something, like you said, dirty, boots un un uh tied and you know, t-shirt, and he's walking like this. What do, what will people say about him? 
And he don't make $100,000 a year, but he loves digging ditches and tearing up concrete. And I just hope women won't dismiss him because he's not making 100000 He could. He might. He may own his own construction won't. company. Or maybe yeah, he own. won't. Yeah. Or maybe he won't. And, 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 he and, loves and, what he does. He loves and, it. And for me, why would we, again, what you like, I love. <laughs> Whatever you think is going to work for you, I know it's going to work for you. I Where you're 10 toes down, I'm 10 toes down, I'm heels included. You got what you want. Enjoy. What I'm saying is in your declaration of what you want, you don't have to tear other people down. Okay. That's it. Okay. That's clear. That's clear. And and then and let me say this also. And I don't know. So I'm asking this question because see, I didn't grow up with this kind of thing. So I don't really know. If let me see how Work with me, brain. Work with me, brain. Use your words, Iyanla. Use your words. Do you find out if he's a good person before or after you find out his salary? That's number one. And number two, if you find he's a good person but doesn't have the salary, then what do you do? So all of you people calling in, the numbers on the screen, this is the R spot. I am Iyamla. My guest today is Dr. Steve Perry. Here's the question I want you to answer for me. Do you find out the salary first and then determine if he's a good person? And if he's a good person and he doesn't have the salary, what do you do? Do I have a caller on the line? Welcome caller. Where are you calling from? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Where are you calling from, beloved? Hi, I'm calling from Jacksonville, Florida. Yes, Jacksonville. Welcome. Thank you so much, Miss Young. It's an honor to talk to you. <laughs> and my guest, Dr. Perry. I'm sorry? And my guest, Dr. Perry. Did you have a question or a comment, beloved? Yes, ma'am, I did. Um, I just feel like as a collective, it would really benefit the Black community if more Black men supported each other to make more money, because I feel like that's the only way we'll rise as a collective. Yeah, no well, I think Black women, now I don't have no argument with that either. And I think Black women should support Black women. And I think we should support each other. I think we need to create generational wealth. You know, I said I would drive a bus driver, but if anybody's planning on asking me for a date, know that I got a prenup because this 45 years of work that I've done goes to my children and my grandchildren. I may love you and you may rock my world, but you get your peace. Uh, and that's why I would never get married again. I, I, you know, I'm open to partnership, companionship, but I would never get married again because, you know, the state would tell me what I got to give you. And what, like I said, 45 years of this, my, uh, my, my, my goodies, my legacy is for my children and my grandchildren, and I don't make no bones about it. Yeah. Do I have a caller on the line? <laughs> Turn yeah. your turn your turn your volume down and put your mouth to the phone. Okay, can you hear me? We yes. sure can. Where are you calling from, beloved? Oh, I'm, I'm just like the last caller. I'm calling from Jacksonville, Florida. Whoa, Jacksonville on the line. You have a comment or a question you want to share? You know what? I I want to say first of all. Shalom, Wagwan, peace, auntie, and bro. <laughs> Hope everybody's having a good day. Um, actually, I am a bus driver. And my husband. Uh, I don't want to date you. Both have CDLs. <laughs> <laughs> so, Not uh, you. You have CDL as well. You both have CDLs. But when we first met, I've had my CDLs for a very long time, since the early beginning of 2000. He recently got his like in like 2015 or 2014 or something. 
And I was making more money than him when we first started. But that conversation didn't come up. You know, I moved from New York, from upstate New York, to be here with him, and I took a dramatic pay cut. But when I met him, it wasn't about how much he made. It was because he made me feel a certain way. Yeah. He made me feel the way I felt when I was young, and I loved it. And I didn't realize how angry I was, because I was a single mom. And so I didn't realize how angry I was until I moved here with him. And one day we had gotten to a kind of a spat. He was like, why are you so angry? And what I had to stop and think, and I had to unpack that. And I was like, why am I angry? And when I found out why I was angry, I had to confess that. I was like, you know, I've been posing a lot of stuff and from previous relationships, or maybe something triggered me from a past discussion and I had to confess that and, and ever since then him and I we watch a lot of stuff we watch a lot of uh, uh, and, uh, relationship shows and we talk we take those conversations and we, talk, and we talked about this right here this topic what you did with Ebony he actually agreed with Ebony I clearly did not agree with Ebony not because she I didn't think that she should have preferences just because I thought that she kind of moved the goalpost and saying that it was her preference because she wanted to be a more feminine woman. And then she kind of went to, uh, I'm trying to raise a black community. I was like, nah, that kind of wasn't where you went the first time. Not saying that her second statement wasn't true because it, it was true according to whoever felt like they weren't reaching their goals. Me personally, I always thought you judge success by your character, by how good of a person you are how you treat somebody. I never thought, and none of my friends, I don't think we ever thought that success was determined by how much money you made. I just never thought that. Well, so I don't I, here's, the question I, that I have. here's the question that I have. If you have someone that makes $100,000 and lives beyond their means and is in a, a lot of debt versus somebody that makes 60000 and manages money well, you may be able to get the same thing done. But beloved, did you have a question? Uh, because people are trying to call in. I want you to get to the heart of your question. No, I, you know, I didn't really have a question. That was really what I wanted to say. I love you guys. And I'll let the other callers get in and have a beautiful afternoon on your day this Friday. Single Good. Thank, Thank you. Chris. And, you know, I, I, I think that, again, you know, it, Maybe because I'm sensitive to energy, I listen very well. And I also know that sometimes we are listening on the inside, gets triggered by what we hear from the outside. And that's what happens and takes the conversation off into, that's what happened with my original conversation. <laughs> And then, so, and bus driver. I won't wait no female bus driver. And let me just that say ain't that you right. though. Let, let, let me just say that ain't you. You asked the right question, and in the context of the conversation, it was received the right way. What has happened since then is um, it's very disappointing to be very honest with you, and at times it's, it, it comes off as cruel. Yeah. Do I have a caller on the line? I know the lines are busy. So when you call in, get straight to your question and then we can hear from as many people as possible right here on the R Spot. My guest today is Dr. Steve Perry. For those who are just tuning in, I want to thank you for holding on, for being patient. Caller, do you have a question or a comment? Where are you calling from? They have to, I know there's a delay. There's a delay, yeah. Hello, 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 turn your sound down and put your mouth right up to the phone. Hi. Hi, hello. where are you coming from, beloved? New York City. Yay, Brooklyn, I hope. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> hey, Brooklyn's in the house. Yes, you have a question or a comment, beloved? Yeah, um, I actually have a comment. Um, I think it's, I got this idea from another um, YouTuber. She talks about a lot of things, but she brought up an interesting point, And I personally think it's also missing um, from the conversation is the fact that, you know, when we talk about socioeconomic, right, like there are two components of that. You have the financial and then you have 
you know, your social circles, your interests, what books have you read, if any, you know? <laughs> um, so I think that what we're missing is that, you know, people are, people are in different social circles and it's hard to overcome, you know, if someone, for example, you go to the ballet on Saturday night, and someone who's never Beloved, I need you to get to the question because people are hanging on and I want to get in as many people as possible. What is your question? Yeah. So my question is, why do we expect, because I feel like we only expect Black women to kind of step out of their social circles to, like you said, meet a bus driver. It's like, okay, well, some people, a bus driver is not even around them. So I think that just because someone isn't finding, I guess, what they're looking for from their social circle, that doesn't mean that they should step out of it. You know what I mean? No, I don't, because I never said that. Where did you hear that somebody is only asking Black women to do that? First of all, I'm Native American, Latin American, and African American. So I have a trifold cultural experience. I ain't never been white in this body. So I'm not going to speak for white women. I, I, and so they can speak their, so I'm talking in a broader human perspective. I didn't, we didn't, in the comment, it turned black. I was talking women, women in general. No, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you said that. I'm talking about the general conversation that people have been having online. I've seen people say, oh, well, um, you know, black women should do this and black women should do that. I'm not saying you said that. So that's why no, I'm asking no, I you, like, that. I don't know why you did that because people see my brown skin and just say that I'm black. They totally dismiss my indigenous side. They totally dismiss my Latin side or that I have that trifold experience. I don't know why. You know why they do it, beloved? Because they don't listen. And then what they hear gets triggered and then they speak from their wounded place and not from the healing place. I think that's why they do it. I could be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong. Is that good? Okay. Um, yeah, I just I just think that we need to remember that, you know, is white women are not out here, you know, who are, went to college and they're working in corporate America. They would not, you know, go out of their social circle to date a bus driver. So we shouldn't expect black women to do the same. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, well, I need it. Yeah, I think that it, no, I don't ahead, know. Steve, hang up and we can pick up a, another okay. caller, but go ahead. Okay. Somebody, no, let me just say this. Let me just say this because it's just so unloving. So when I said that I have a trifold cultural experience, very often people see the brown skin and just consider me black and not that I'm red and brown. So somebody just put in the thread, so you're not black? Absolutely, I'm black to the bone, red it, it to does. the center, you know, Latin, Latin to the core. Yeah. Well, that, the cool. But my point is this, Steve, that is the very same thing that we do in our relationships That's my point. that break them down, that little nastiness. And I don't know if that was a woman or a man. Doesn't matter. Women do that to it each does. other. And then that's the kind of thing that a salary will not address. Well, not, not at all. Not, not at all. It, it, and it, I mean, it, one of the things that happens with social media, one of the many things is it democratizes access to people in a way that people say things that if they're being even honest with themselves, they don't. They wouldn't say that if they were standing in front of you or me or anyone else for that matter. They, that's just not even how they really feel, and they don't want to show up into the world that way. But it's what they're allowed to do through anonymous um, finger pointing. Can I ask a question? And please forgive me. And if I get to have to do it, I want a white woman to call. Because how this conversation got to be, for my conversation, which was about women, how this conversation got to be just Black, I don't know. I'm talking think, about feminine energy, period. Yeah, yeah. I think I would I would say that one reason it is because of the obvious aesthetic of, of both you and Ebony. Um, but I think it has also morphed since then because of the disparity between African-American male achievement as it relates to economic 
and African-American female achievement as it relates to educational and economic. The, 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 the gap that's widening between black men and black women is something that is well charted and it is something that we should be talking about, yeah. but not using as a hammer to beat men over the head. And I think that there's a need, I think there's a thirst within the black community to have that conversation about why, about how do I exist as a woman who has a master's or a JD or a PhD who wants to have a partner who I believe to be evenly yoked. So I'm measuring them by their, by their academic and economic achievements. While the fact that these men who are black um, typically are not achieving at the same academic levels as I. And so I think that you've sparked something while otherwise unintentionally um, that speaks to a conversation that's happening in many living rooms between black people, which is what does the future of my, my relationships look like? Yeah, but here's a, here's a question too, Stephen, as an educator, Carla, I'm coming to you. For me, um, the public school system so dishonors Black people in general, Black men specifically. Destroy. It, 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 it destroys them, absolutely. As, it wasn't my sons going to school and my grandsons going to school. It was me in the kitchen and on the sofa and talking about really the power and the beauty of, of Black history and, 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 and African culture and Native American culture that, that put some, you know, hoots in, in, my, in my, my grandson and my son. And, and this system, and now that they're trying to outlaw what they teach us about who we are, I, you know, my great, great grandson, he can't go to public school. I will not. If I have to homeschool him from my walker. <laughs> with and, that my be far, and, that's, and that's the part of this conversation that's not being truly nuanced supported, meaning that when you're looking at the end product of Black women, being the, uh, what I'm told is the highest growing group of entrepreneurs, the highest growing group of d advanced degree getters among all attainers of all, and African-American men, not just slowing, but literally being stopped. What we're not considering is that there's actually something on top of them. There is a boot on their neck. Yeah. There is. Chauvin isn't the only person who killed a black man. I mean, it is happening every single day. I can tell you that in schools that I've run, where we've had a gift and talented program, 85% of the school is black, 15% of it's white, and 45% of the school is a school's gift and talented program is white. How is that possible? Under my nose, under my watch, it's happened. So there are conscious decisions that are being made in our schools that are destroying. That's why we're here. Okay. That's why we're here. Well, I, I think that like, I don't want us to lose sight of the conversation. Uh, loving with conditions, using status and income and, and economic position as a criteria for dating and mating, which came back to would you would you date a bus driver and setting uh, uh, economic criteria for the transaction of relationships, which grew out of a conversation about women showing up with such masculine energy, with so much intellect, less intuition, less heart space, more mind space, till we are not even evaluating and choosing and assessing partners from a place that's true, real, and authentic for us. So we got all of that in the mishmash today. It's been a great conversation. I hope you've learned something. And I think I have a caller on the line. Caller, are you there? We hear you, caller. Turn your uh, volume down and put your mouth to the phone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Where are you calling from? I just want, I'm calling from Chicago, the far south Shout side where we love to death. <laughs> I just and, want and to say, a question? As, a, as a black man, I'm so disappointed from what I'm hearing. And my wife, before we were married, she took me as unemployed and probably would have been happy if I was a bus driver. Mm. But she thought redeeming <laughs> she saw the redeeming qualities in me as, as a person and said, if there are 10 boxes to be checked and you got seven out of 10, brother, I can work with that. Wow. Mm. So 
and I'll, I'll I'll keep it short, but I cringe that some of her friends look at us as the gold standard of marriage, but didn't see the work we put in and invest in each other emotionally. And so I, I just feel really, really discouraged from some of the sisters, black or white, whatever color, who overlook a, a, a hardworking person who's driving a bus. Like that's a, mm-hmm. a, a, a negative attribute to have that you, you, you're a civil servant or whatever. And so I just feel like, hey, let's stop looking at surface level stuff and look at the person and, uh, you know, give each other a chance. That's all I got. I love you both. You raised me in my life indirectly and we love the work. Thank you. I want to ask you a question, though, because, I, you know, I, I always like to give people a an opportunity. You said you were unemployed when you got married. Is that accurate? Is that what you said? That's interesting. That's interesting. He speaks speaks to a feeling that I've had to be completely honest with you, sis. The reason I, you know, I don't typically get involved in these conversations, but this one was different for me. This hurt me. When when I, I, there was a cruelty that I heard that was coming towards men that I felt like is not necessary. You don't have to go that hard. There's, there's, I I, I liken it to when I'm working with children, y'all can pick on each other, right? We, because there's always going to be some of that. But there's a point at which you, that what you just said about him, you know that they're homeless. That's not funny. Making fun of that. There, there has to be rules, right? There has to be rules of engagement, things that we can play about. That you can't do. Same here. This was a brother, and I feel him. I lost my job within a year of being married. Mm. I sat on my couch with the master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, honors in this and da da da, totally unemployed with no money coming in. And I sat on that couch and prayed that God would give me the opportunity to one day work in a school, just work in one. I was watching the uh, Columbine shootings at that point. Like I was, it was, it was unfolding while I was sitting on the couch. And I said, God, please give me a chance to be a part of that. Please give me a chance. But I had no job. <laughs> you believe me now? We, we find now, but that hurt. When I heard the things that were being said, when I've heard them being said, you're not, th- th- this is not motivational. And, and don't you think for a second that you any better than anybody, that you get to set the gold standard, that you're going to raise the race by telling us we're mediocre because we work for, for the community. That's mediocrity to you? I don't ever want to be excellent in that person's eyes. Never. Never do I want to be excellent in somebody's eyes who looks at a servant, somebody who serves their community as mediocre. Well, here's a comment for you. So now we need to give unemployed black men a chance. Here's another one. He hurt the way they've been dogging us out. That's a comment for you. And that doesn't have anything to do with this conversation. And that's what happens. Those people got stuff that inside as women that they need to clean up so that they can move in a different way. Uh, uh, Whose couch would you- That's that meanness that you're talking about though. That's that meanness. Yes. That's that meanness. That's that's that aggression. Yeah. That's, that's that meanness. meanness. That the bus driver, the lawyer, the judge, the cop, nobody wants that coming from a woman because that's a heart condition. That condition oh, is in that matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no woman wants to come home to a man talking to her like that. Nobody does. Ladies, my sister women. Again, you can have your criteria, you can have your standards, whether it's $100,000 or, or, or no dollars or, or whatever it is. But here is my conversation for you. Move from the feminine of your heart. That's what will tell you what's important. Move from the energy of your heart, not your intellect. And we as women, so many of us are men in skirts. We move from the heart, we are neck down dead. And we demand and require things, not just of the men that we want to love, but of our sons, of men in general. And, and we, we just, it's, we need to anchor the feminine energy back on the planet because the biggest woman of all, the biggest feminine energy of all is the earth. 
and she's turning on us. <laughs> okay, the weather, the, the 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 tsunami, the volcano, the they they just gonna wash poor Mississippi right off the map. That is the biggest feminine energy. Again, I'm talking about feminine energy and all of these questions about relationships. I find quite exciting and interesting because I'm old school. Me and Grandma Snookums, we are old. <laughs> So a lot of these things that I hear, I just don't, I just, I don't understand. I want to know, when do you ask the con the question about the income? Do you ask it early on before you know him? Or do you ask it later on? Dr. Perry, why didn't any men, what is, let me see that. There's a question specifically to you. Why didn't any men have a problem? Well, now we're not going to talk about him. We're going to leave that brother alone. They want to know about why you didn't have a comment about Kevin Samuels. But that's not what we're talking about. Stay focused. Focus, focus. Let me go to my caller. <laughs> caller, are you there? Where are you calling from? <laughs> Let me go to my caller. Caller, are you there? Where are you calling from? I am. Hello, I'm in Florida. Turn your sound down. Put your mouth to the phone. Thank you, beloved. Where are you calling from? I'm in Florida. I'm in Bonita Springs, Florida. What is this with Florida and Chicago? Okay, what's your question or your comment, beloved? So you had asked for a white woman to call in, and here I am. Yay, a white lady! <laughs> hey, Becky! <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying this conversation so much because I've dated men that make less than I do, and they somehow will start off wanting to date a successful woman, and then they want to break that woman. They are intimidated by the fact that I make more money and that I like to do things the way I'm used to living and they're not used to living that way. Okay. And it's difficult. I don't mind paying for dinners, but they want to, to pay, but then we end up in different types of restaurants or hotels, things like that. So it's kind of a different lifestyle and it hasn't worked in the past. And I really related to that men in skirts or ladies in men in skirts comment. But I think the one thing that you're saying to us is that it's now across the board that a white woman who makes more, uh, earns more than a white man would have the same kind of issues that black women have made up are only about black men. Becky, I appreciate you. <laughs> So what do you do, my love? What do you do? What do you do? I'm a real estate broker. No, I didn't mean in your job. You giving me your credentials. I mean, what do you do in the oh, relationship okay. when you make more than... <laughs> we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Okay, so what do you do when you find out that it's not working? I mean, how do you manage that? How do you as a white woman, because for whatever reason, black women seem to think this is only their problem. Thank you so much for calling. So what do you what do you do? You know, it's hard because sometimes my heart gets involved and, you know, I I I found myself playing small. For example, I was going to Italy last summer and my boyfriend was trying to to find money to pay the car payment. And I couldn't talk about Italy in front of him. I couldn't show my excitement about my trip with my girlfriend. And so I kind of played small so that he could feel bigger. And it didn't feel good to me. And it didn't feel good to him. Wow. And he has two children. I have no children. So it was, you know, he would buy dinner and then feel guilty that he wasn't sending the money to his daughters. So can I jump in there? He wanted to send the money to his daughter, so I want to big him up for that. I do. Good. Can, Good can I jump in? First of all, thank you for sharing your story. And there's nothing that is linear about this. There's nothing simple about what you're saying. Um, and no one should judge you for uh, again wanting what you want and wanting to travel to Italy if Italy is where you wish to be. One of the things I, I can offer, though, is this: it's about the overall contribution to the relationship. Um, there are some things, for instance, that your partner can do that you cannot, and, and some things that he that you can do that he cannot, for for the sake of this. And in so in, in such a space as that, you determine what you value, right? So if it is traditional roles that are driven by economics, then 
then there's that. But there are other ways to to engage in making sure that each of you, to uh, Iyana's earlier point, her 75% versus her ex's 75%, it's not the same 75%, but it's 75% of your contribution. And so what then can be done? And then I, I would offer this to, to many uh, women who are trying to have a, a relationship with a man and not make him feel like crap. Don't make him feel like crap. Acknowledge the things he can do in the same way you'd want to be acknowledged for the things you can do. Money is not the end all be all. It changes. And as you know, as a real estate broker, things could go be, really, be going really well for you. And then they could not be, God forbid, but they couldn't, that your face could change. So identifying something other than your economic uh, uh, intersections or or, um, or, 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 confluent, or or changing directions of those things, find something else that you have in common, find a thing that matters to you, and then work towards it. If if you can, if you can't, you can't. And and here's the thing, Steve, and I, and I don't know this to be true for her. And in Zinger 75, I'm getting ready to call you out. I'm getting ready to call you out because you will not dishonor this conversation, my guest, or me. She says she is making our point, but I guess it's more valid because she's white. And nobody has said or raised what she said. I, I wasn't even talking about that. She made the point, but here's my point that I want to make in Zynga 75. Here's the point that I want to make. She said that, and I, I know this is what happened with me and my husband. So let me speak about it personally. I didn't mind paying for the thing, but as a man, it crushed him when I did so. And she said she played small. I didn't even know how to do that. I didn't even know how to do small. But he didn't want me to pay for the trip. He didn't want me to pay for dinner. It would, that would crush him. So then we just didn't go. <laughs> and, and let me just, I, I don't try, I try to spend as little time engaging in ignorant statements as possible, but just for this sake. I don't you know, know why I did it because it's energy. It's energy. No, 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 no. But, but, but I was going to say this. I don't know if the men she's dating is are black or white. I don't know that. Me. So right. I, it's not even a point of conversation. But I think you have a really interesting caller. Uh, I see in the comments somebody very interesting. Uh, Where? Uh, if you look, I think the next caller is someone who I think would be interesting to. Okay, caller, are you there? I am. Good. And who are you? And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Chicago as well. Okay, good. Welcome. And your comment okay, or I'm question? Calling because, uh oh, my husband just called <laughs> <laughs> and he shared the show with me. So I started watching. And I just wanted to say there's a couple of things happening. He mentioned that when, he, when we got married, he was unemployed, which he was. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah. I want to... Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so I just wanted to share, I think, and I agree with what you all are saying, and I have friends as well who are having a hard time in relationships. But what I wanted to say is that finances, work conditions, life conditions, all those things change and shift. And if you plan on having any type of real connection to any person, husband, otherwise, you have to have a foundational connection, value alignment, love, respect, those things. And they will translate because I don't know that when we, when we got married, I actually made a nice amount of money. Today, that was seven years ago. Today, we, are mm. we, we now make the same amount of money. <laughs> and I've also grown my income. So but the piece I wanted to really touch on that maybe this is weird talking to y'all on the delay, but what I would like for you all to speak about is how society beats down black men. And, and so I just hate that we also beat down black men sometimes. And so it's okay if the love, if the respect, if the value alignment is there to work through the things that maybe you, you, weren't expecting to work through. So that's my contribution to the conversation. Thank you, beloved. Thank you. And I'm so glad you hung in there with him. 
it's it's a, it's that's so good. Thank you. You know, um, we are at the top of the hour, so we're gonna have to wrap this up. And again, thank everybody for tuning in, for calling in, for being on the line, because obviously this is a much needed conversation, a much needed conversation. And I want to go back to the original premise, which is um, that as women. I, I really want you to hear me. As women, we can turn this thing around. We can turn this around where we can get what we want. We can have the love that we want. We can be valued and respected. That we can find partners that value and respect us. That we can honor them regardless of how much they make. If we move into our power as women, we can, we can turn this thing around. And my concern is that, you know, because we've shifted into this masculine way of thinking and being, and, 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 and we do love with conditions. You know, uh, uh, as a mom, you know, my babies might have been ugly as, as warmed over poop, but they were beautiful to me because I was loving them with my heart you know, and I will frequently say, I don't do ugly. And I've dated some pretty nice looking men to me. And they may be something that somebody else wouldn't look at at all, <laughs> you know, but what I want to say, my sister women, get out of your heads, get into your bodies, clean up your hearts, clean them up. And not only will you attract the person you're supposed to love, you won't care that he drives a bus or picks up trash or works in the morgue. And you, you might attract one who's a judge or a lawyer or a doctor or a neurosurgeon. You might attract one who's an artist, who's a sculptor or a painter, but you're gonna attract your vibrational match and you don't have to worry about what he makes. He's gonna be your vibrational match. And I wanna encourage us as women. I'm, I'm talking to the women because that's where this conversation started. I didn't start talking to men. I wanna to talk to the women. And I wanna say, we have got to stop putting men down, number one, and putting each other down. We have to stop it. I don't care if it's Ebony or Becky or Francis or Shaquina, I don't care. As women, we have to re-channel our energy. We have to re-channel our energy and stop looking at other human beings to make us happy. <clears throat> it's enough to get up, brush your teeth, take a shower, put your clothes on, tie your shoes, get to work, do the work. You, you can't make anybody else responsible for your happiness. You want somebody to bring you the icing, not the cake. You the cake, boo. That's what I want women to understand. You are the cake. So I'm challenging us to stop this. They didn't do this. They did. I've been beaten, raped. I'm telling you, my husband, my husband, not my boyfriend that I was living with. My husband broke my jaw when I was six months pregnant. And if I can heal from that, we can heal. I want us to heal and anchor our hearts and our intuition and our healing power on the planet as women. And I promise you, if you do that, it really won't matter what he makes. You will attract, and your partner's not in jail if you're not in jail. And your partner ain't a drug addict if you ain't a drug addict. Your partner ain't gay if you ain't gay. You are the only one who gets to say what goes on in your life. I want to thank you. Dr. Steve, do you have some closing words? I want to thank you for being here with us today. <laughs> um, you know, where I'll say this. This to me is an important conversation. First of all, thank you for having me. And thank all of you who participated on the level with the vibration that this was meant to uh, engage. That being, uh, date who you want to date. Or don't date who you don't want to date. <laughs> Establish your priorities. They're yours. It's your life. And don't tear other people down. We yeah. as black people have enough people 
have enough experience with being torn down. The last thing that any one of us needs is to look up on anybody's screen and see somebody who looks like us from our community making us feel less than we should feel. And finally, there is no secret to a happy marriage except for to be happy. <laughs> and there is no such thing as an uninterrupted pursuit of happiness. And so whatever it is that you're looking for in your relationship, might I suggest you bring it? Mm. Yeah, I would say that. And let's have another conversation about generational wealth and creating wealth. That's a conversation. That's a needed conversation. Let's have another conversation about mothers raising their sons from their heart and not from their aggressive, hurt, broken, woundedness. Let's have another. I mean, there's so many conversations that we well, need to have and we're not all going to see it the same way and we're not all going to agree. That's fine, but we don't have to tear everybody down. I am Iyanla. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Steve Perry. I want to thank you, uh, the listeners and the callers. Sorry that we couldn't get to everybody. This is the R Spot. You can hear the entire season of the R Spot on Spotify, on uh, iHeartRadio, and I am housed and home at Shondaland Audio. So you can go there and see it too. Go back and listen to some of the past episodes and you'll see that I'm not just jumping into this conversation. We've been doing this. Uh, if you want to make your relationships whole and healthy and happy, and I'm looking forward to a new season of The R Spot. All of you uh, sister women out there, check out our Rites of Passage program that is coming up. Uh, in June, check it out, nine weeks online and then in person so that we can heal together. You know, I think there's nothing more powerful than women praying together, dancing together, singing together and healing together because that'll shift the atmosphere of the planet. So to all of you that have been with us today, thank you for hanging in there. To my uh, producer, Vince and Miss Angie, uh, thank you. Dr. Steve Perry, deep bow to you. You know, I love you. Thank you for being here. And listen, before you go out, uh, everybody that's been on this thread with us, before you go out talking about what I said about Ebony and what he said about women and you agree or disagree, just sit down, shut up and listen within. Identify what triggered, what got triggered in you? Did your wound get triggered? Did your hurt get triggered? Did your memory get triggered? Somebody said in there, yeah, and you attracted an abusive man. Yes, because I grew up as an abused child. My father physically abused me. My grandmother physically abused me. Thank God I'm better now. A brother would not want to think about raising his hand in my presence because he would draw back a nub. <laughs> he would draw back a nub. Anyway, uh, have a great, great summer. Be safe. Tonight is the full moon. Be careful. Be careful in your driving, in your speaking, and please be care-filled in your loving. Bye. Take care.